Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here or connected online. So to, uh, today we have the third event of the Gender Unbalanced AI Seminars uh, with Silvia Zuffi. So um, she uh, will talk, um, she will give a talk about 3D computer vision for animals. And well, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here to, to present my my main research uh, topic. And actually, I will give a kind of, of overview <coughs> of my work from, from the beginning, from when I started to, to look into this topic. So I'm a research scientist at CNR, at the Institute of Applied Mathematics in Milan, and I'm an affiliated researcher at the MPIIS in uh, Tübingen and uh, where most of this work uh, was done. So, um, why animals? So animals are a, are a precious resource for our society, but unfortunately they're often um, overexploited and threatened. And uh, so in my work, I want to develop intelligent systems that are able to interpret uh, visual, but uh, actually also sound data to address uh, uh, problems in uh, conservation, in wellness, in uh, human and animal coexistence, uh, but also create methods for improving our basic knowledge about animals and developing um, new technologies applied to the animal world. <clears throat> so what are the current problems? So in conservation, how do we know if a species is in danger? We need to count the individuals. And this is actually a very critical point because these uh, animals are often hidden and hard to find. So detection and identification with, with non-invasive techniques is very important. And today is only automated for partner species, like for example, zebras. And in animal or human coexistence, it's very important to monitor uh, the effect of human activities on the ecosystems. And this requires uh, understanding changes in animal presence and their behavior. So in wellness, we need to understand animal pain and to act before the injury occurs. And this is very important for animals like horses um, that can hardly recover. And an open problem is also how to automatically identify health issues from shape, for example, to investigate um, animals uh, in uh, wild uh, environments. So in robotics, uh, there is an interest in understanding animal locomotion to mimic these highly efficient uh, machines and design future robots. And this requires capturing animals during challenging actions. So what do people do today on these topics? So animal identification for counting individuals is mostly approaching 2D. So these are examples from uh, WildMe, uh, which is a platform that supports the definition of um, systems called uh, books that are specific for a, specific, for a species of interest, like the mantas, the, the zebras, gravy zebras here, or whales and dolphins. Um, so for textured species, uh, the systems uh, can match images from similar viewpoint, as you can see, for example, for the zebra, using 2D image features, or body contours, like in whales, or also for the elephant ears. So at present, uh, animal behavior research is dominated by 2D methods, uh, specifically 2D pose estimation, where a set of body landmarks in image coordinates is identified and uh, tracked through a video. And this is due to the popularity of tools like a uh, deep cut, which are very easy to, to work with and have been, um, uh, they've made computer vision applicable in different uh, fields. So this, uh, uh, in this image, you see many examples of deep cut applied to, to animals, but this can be extended to any, any video with feature of interest. So, but I argue that 2D landmarks are an ambiguous representation for animal posture. 
So consider uh, these uh, uh, two videos. Um, here the animal is performing a similar motion, so it's rolling the trunk. But if we look at the to the landmarks alone, the pattern is different. And so that because the elephant is seen from different viewpoints. This is kind of for you, computer vision is quite obvious. Um, but why for lab settings with a fixed camera using 2D landmarks could be could be acceptable. Uh, this is not optimal uh, when using, for example, drones for monitoring wild animals, because here uh, the, the animals and the camera are moving. So another topic, robotics. Here, maneuverability is critical for uh, the design of uh, future robots, uh, but this is actually already implemented in wild animals for survival. So in particular, uh, the cheetah uh, being the fastest terrestrial animal is, is very interesting um, for robotics. And there is an interesting fact that I learned from uh, Professor Amir Patel. So the cheetah, the cheetah's tail has been traditionally considered a counterweight, like uh, here in this, uh, in this picture. But uh, actually, it's only the 2% of the body mass. So in my view, looking at the motion through, uh, we we'll say the foggy lens of 2D and 3D landmarks is not sufficient. So we need to model the body mass and the weight. So my approach is uh, instead of uh, looking at animals 2D, uh, to consider model-based 3D vision. And specifically uh, through the definition of generative models of animals able to represent 3D shape, articulation, and appearance. So what, does, what is a generative model? So I'm sure you don't have to ask this question to, to this audience, uh, but to, to, you know, to repeat and summarize, is the representation where a low dimensional um, space drives the definition of a high dimensional output. And this representation is useful when the data is noisy or ambiguous, as this latent space um, encodes prior knowledge about um, what the high dimensional output can be. So with respect to the landmarks methods, uh, using a 3D model provides a, a richer analysis of the data. So we can uh, we predict a surface or a volume, so we can reason about uh, contact and occupancy. And uh, uh, we also uh, can support and supervise learning as we can reconstruct uh, the input data. So now if we consider the previous example with the elephant, if we can fit a 3D model to the video, uh, we obtaining uh, similar 3D poses for frames where the animal has the same posture, uh, we have a consistent uh, description of the, of the behavior which we didn't have if we consider it to the to the landmarks. So, but to be, to be uh, useful, uh, generative models should be rich and expressive, uh, meaning they should be able to represent all possible animal poses and shapes. So in single view reconstruction, even if one is often interested in capturing um, 3D pose, shape is still important. So because it's functional to the recovery of 3D from ambiguous monocular data. So for example, consider this uh, picture uh, with a tiger. So on the right, we have, a, a, I would say, a plausible 3D reconstruction. But if we look at the results from the top, we see that the recovery 3D pose is wrong. Uh, here there is this uh, very unnatural rotation of the shoulders. Um, and this is because the shape is wrong, the torso is too long. And so when we talk about 3D reconstruction, shape and pose are equally important. But shape can also be very important information by itself, for example, to understand uh, animal health. So in summary, if we create generative models that are rich enough to reconstruct real individuals, and we couple them with models of the environment, uh, a wide range of applications opens up. We can think of doing shape-aware identification, biomechanics analysis, disease forecasting, biodiversity monitoring, content creation, and so on. Okay, so, but why is creating 3D generative models hard? 
I say it's hard because apparently so far I'm one of the only few people that have considered this topic, so it could be even hard or boring. <laughs> um, but um, I think it's hard. So uh, creating realistic animal models uh, requires a lot of effort. Uh, we can, uh, of course, we have uh, really, really realistic examples from the from the film industry. But these uh, CG models, uh, uh, they can be animated, but they cannot easily uh, change shape and represent a population of individuals. But I'm pretty sure you're familiar uh, with models of the human body. So what currently exists uh, are uh, these 3D realistic models of the human body and face and also hands. Uh, they can represent people of different body shape and have been widely adopted also from the industry. And here the shape uh, uh, deformation model is learned from 3D scans, but from thousands of 3D scans. It's happening. Uh, while uh, there is uh, a 3D pose prior that is learned from motion capture um, that is used to regularize the 3D pose when, uh, when the model is used to, to fit images and video. But animals are not cooperative. So uh, what works for humans does not apply to, to arbitrary animals as only domesticated subjects are suitable for data capture. And I apologize here, I didn't put uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the attribution to these pictures, uh, but uh, the, the one with the green uh, background is from the camera center at the University of Bath where they do motion capture for for dogs. So what, what is our solution for creating generative models of animals? In 2017, we introduced the first 3D articulated shape model, small, uh, where we use 3D scans of toy figurines to learn shape for domestic and wild species. So here you see uh, shapes from small in the video and uh, on the uh, left uh, picture, some of the scan of the toys that we have used, and below the model fit to images of real animals. So small is learned from a small set of toy figurines, uh, which uh, represent uh, uh, species in five different uh, families of quadrupeds. So the family of cats, of uh, which includes tigers, lions, so on, dogs, uh, horses, cows, and also hippos. And small builds on the long tradition of 3D morphable models and is a formulation that uh, given shape and pose variables uh, that forms a template to return a 3D object. So the shape and pose um, variables are here are uh, betas for shape and theta for pose are disentangled, meaning they are independent in the model. So beta lives uh, in a low dimensional latent space, so we can sample beta and generate arbitrary animals. So why this entangle representation? Uh, because it allows comparing posture across different species. And this is not possible if we use, for example, uh, body lab. So to, def to define uh, these entangled spaces, we need to learn the shape space from 3D samples in a reference pose. So they need that our samples need to be all in the same, uh, um, we call it T pose. Uh, but of course, our toys are not. And this requires, so this requires implementing uh, the following pipeline. So we start from uh, the 3D scans. We bring them in correspondence with a process that is called registration. And uh, you see the, the output of this uh, registration is color coded here. And uh, then uh, we need to put them in the same reference pose. And uh, then we can do PCA on the vertices and uh, compute an average shape, which here is called VT, and uh, a linear space of deformation that uh, sampling beta variables allows to create uh, random animals. 
So the, the hardest challenge in learning the model is the registration, uh, because differently from the human case where uh, subjects, humans are more or less uh, more similar than different animals, but uh, they have been scanned all in the same pose. Here, our toys are very different for shape and pose. So our approach was to align all the 3D scan to a common art animal that we decided to be aligned. So we define a novel registration method that is based on the forming um, the lioness um, template that you see here um, with the, the color segmentation. So we, we obtained this uh, uh, 3D mesh from an artist. We segmented into parts, and for each part, we define a synthetic shape deformations, um, which are spaces uh, with a seven dimension um, for for scale, global scale, and scale for each uh, coordinate and three stretching deformation. And uh, then uh, with this model that you call GLOSS, we align the lioness to the toys. And here in this video, you, you see an example of the registration. So here we have a hyena and we want to align the lioness. And is a, okay. this is how, how it works. And uh, what you obtain are these uh, toys with these uh, lioness features. Uh, not really a good uh, shape representation, but uh, we have from this, this 3D pose. And then we need to refine this uh, uh, initial, um, uh, say, lioness approximation uh, with the model free uh, registration step where the vertices are free to move to match the surface of the scan. Uh, with this uh, as rigid as possible um, regularization. And uh, so in this way, you obtain uh, accurate 3D shapes, 3D pose and per vertex correspondence. And uh, given we have the 3D pose from the initial gloss registration, we can undo the pose and obtain uh, um, our post normalized training set. OK, in doing PCA, as I said before, we compute this average um, animal in the middle, and uh, these are, um, this picture represents the main direction of uh, shape variation that you can see. The first one is scale, and then we have uh, the variation that seems to span across different, different species. So what is a characteristic of small is that it represents uh, um, different species in this uh, uh, single shape space, which sounds a bit uh, weird. And uh, one of the reasons we did this is that uh, we had limited data. So I think with uh, more data, a single animal model uh, could be better. Uh, but this multi-animal uh, representation has the advantage that um, you know, we can do also animals that were not in the training set um, as maybe animals of interest can be represented as a sort of combination of features that can be borrowed by different species. But if, and if we want to generate, uh, if we gen if we sample betas uh, randomly, we obtain uh, most of the time animals that do not exist because they could be in the middle between a horse and a hippo, for example. So with small uh, to use small as a generative model for real animals, we need to sample according to the clusters that correspond to the families. Okay, any questions so far? So what is uh, what is missing in the small model? Uh, there are of course uh, many animals that are missing, and some of them could be uh, simply um, added as uh, extra toys, but some uh, could not. For example, a giraffe might need a more a more articulated neck. A moose uh, has uh, big horns that we cannot uh, represent uh, as a deformation from the lioness, for example. Also, the elephant has a trunk, large ears. Um, and there could be also animals that are not available as toys and will never be possible to scan with a 3D scanner. So, for example, the northern white rhino, uh, 
with only two exemplars left, and the Tasmanian tiger, which is extinct. So, but if we have an um, animal that is not too far from the small quadrupeds, we can reconstruct the 3D shape using multiple images. Uh, and these images uh, are not a multi-view capture. They could be uh, random images with a, where the animal has different poses. And uh, in fact, even if these uh, images come from different sources and have no calibration information, uh, a constant here is, a, is the animal shape. So we can fit small to each image uh, jointly minimizing this uh, uh, long energy uh, using key points and uh, silhouette. And uh, we minimize jointly over, uh, in this example, the three images with different poses, different camera parameters, but this, the same um, shape variables, betas. And we obtain uh, the best approximation of the rhino in this case, according to the small model, which is this sort of uh, big hippo. And this, of course, is not, is not sufficient because what characterizes the rhino is actually the horse. Uh, so, but now uh, we can, uh, um, we start from the small uh, approximation and we can describe, represent uh, the shape, um, the surface in a slightly different way as uh, the shape, the small um, um, shape B plus, um, the formation of the vertices. And then if we have pictures where we actually see from the silhouette the, the shape features that we want to recover, uh, like the horn in this case, uh, we can minimize uh, this energy, uh, keeping all variable fixed and only optimizing over these vertex displacements, such, at, such that the initial uh, blue surface deforms to match the silhouettes and we obtain this uh, uh, gold uh, gold result. And now that we have this, uh, uh, like very, I would say, accurate uh, matching with the with the silhouette, um, we can grab the colors from the images and actually create real avatars of animals that can be animated because we have the small uh, the small skeleton. And here, this uh, this is the northern white rhino. Um, and we did this from a few pictures. And then for the Tasmanian tiger, uh, we found this uh, uh, video from the Hobart Zoo, which hosted the, the last uh, individual uh, in captivity. Uh, here we pick a, a few frames uh, from this video where the animal is fully visible. And we, um, we generated the 3D articulated uh, animal, which of course is grayscale, but the real one uh, was uh, Brown with uh, with these uh, uh, blue stripes. Okay, so yeah, actually these are other examples that were on the paper, and the code is online. Uh, maybe a bit outdated in terms of uh, uh, technology, uh, but it's still working. Okay. Um, now let's see how to use uh, the small model to actually do 3D pose and shape estimation uh, from images. So in 2019, uh, we addressed the problem of estimating 3D shape and pose of the gravy zebra from images. So the gravy zebra is an endangered species. Uh, uh, it's the one here with the red uh, um, um, boundary. And um, it's a bit different from uh, the plain zebra, which maybe is the most popular that you see below. So the gravy has these very thin stripes, uh, has a white belly, and the ears are uh, round. And in this work, uh, we we want to predict 3D shape, pose, and texture of the gravy zebra. And here, the texture prediction is not just to create avatars, but we make the hypothesis that if we predict the texture, we obtain a better uh, shape and pose. And actually, I always put this I found this online, this picture that you see on the left is from an artist. And uh, I think it's really a nice visualization of the fact that removing the stripes from the belly makes the estimation of the belly shape harder. I guess you can 
agree with me about that. Okay, so the the gravy lives uh, in a in a small area in Kenya uh, near the Mount Kenya, and every a couple of years, uh, there is this uh, Great Gravies Rally, which is an initiative where people uh, drive around this area with uh, cameras and take pictures and video of the zebras. And the goal is to count the individuals. And before I was mentioning wild me. Uh, so actually people take the pictures, they upload in the wild book uh, for zebras, and then the system matches the images to count the individuals. So we collaborated uh, with uh, WildMe, and uh, so we had access to uh, several pictures of the same individuals. So now if you can you can guess what we did with this. Uh, we used this uh, uh, technique for creating avatars that I explained before uh, to create um, uh, gravy zebra avatars. So from a few images of the same individual, we ran the code. You turn the 3D model and the texture map. And uh, from this, uh, uh, we can create a synthetic data set with uh, 3D ground truth for everything, for the texture, for the uh, pose, uh, uh, the camera. And um, so here, uh, the it's a synthetic data set, not by me, I should call it a semi-synthetic because the animal, the shape and the appearance is actually captured, comes from the images. But the background is a random background and uh, the pose is also um, generated from a simple 3D pose prior. So then um, we use this uh, um, synthetic data set to train a, a, a network that given an input image predicts uh, the 3D zebra. And so the network um, is quite simple. Um, we have an encoder. This is 2019, maybe today, uh, you know, people would do it in a different way, but uh, um, you encode the image, your computer set of features, and then you have three independent parts to one estimate the texture, one the shape, and one uh, the pose, 3D pose, uh, the focal length and translation, and use a perspective camera model. And we have uh, 3D supervision for, for everything, for training, but given we also predict a texturate uh, animal, we can, in addition, use a photometric loss. Uh, so we take the input image, we multiply by the uh, segmentation, uh, ground truth segmentation mask, and uh, we compare with generated animals. And uh, this, uh, this is the, this longer set of, of um, um, loss with all the uh, mask, key points, camera, all, all supervised. And um, so the texture prediction actually is a, it happens um, for on um, like in different uh, uh, planes of so different sections because we have this texture map uh, that uh, you can consider it uh, uh, divided in a, in a set of in a set of images. And uh, the shape predictor actually uh, predicts the deformation from uh, the small uh, horse template. And a, a bit of more details about uh, the texture, um, the texture prediction. We don't predict directly colors because uh, the network are typically uh, lazy and uh, instead of predicting uh, stripes uh, would predict, I don't know, a grayish uniform color. So what we actually do, we predict uh, the UV flow. So from where to get the pixel, the colors from the image, to create the texture map. And here I actually given uh, a, a result. I replaced the input images with this uh, uh, checkerboard to illustrate uh, from where the colors are, are taken from the image. So you see that actually the UV flow kind of follows the shape of the animal. And uh, this is uh, also, I think this works because um, Given we have this, uh, um, we have the ground truth texture maps, 
it's like having a very dense set of of key points during training. So these are uh, results from the regression network, which uh, uh, works uh, works quite well. Um, so you see the input image, uh, the the reconstruction overlap to the image, and uh, the reconstruction with the predicted texture. But uh, we can do uh, can improve these results at test time because again we predict uh, a textured animal, so we can do some unsupervised improvement at test time, uh, meaning that we can minimize again a photometric loss, um, but this time over the whole image because we don't have uh, the input uh, segmentation uh, mask. And we do this by fixing all the network weights and uh, only optimizing over the network features. So in a way, we are assuming the network knows a better solution, but uh, uh, with the regression, we did not hit the right features, but we can move a bit around this uh, feature space uh, to find an improved um, solution, or like at least any, a solution that minimizes the photometric loss. And we saw that this actually improves the results. Uh, you can see here in these examples where we have a better matching of the legs, uh, of the head. And in our experiments, uh, uh, we found that this optimization of the features actually works better than optimizing directly over uh, the, the variables. And uh, also we tested our hypothesis of uh, uh, using a texture prediction and uh, again, uh, the, the texture, predicting the texture helps for 3D pose and shape. OK, so. Um, today, uh, I think there is a lot of interest in training from uh, synthetic data. So I would like to add a, a comment on why our uh, system works so well. So we train only on sin sin this semi-synthetic data set. Um, but uh, so the, the grape zebra lives uh, uh, mostly in this uh, uh, area in Kenya, which uh, here is in um, this red region. So essentially you take pictures there and you have taken pictures of mostly uh, all the individuals that you can ever see um, in nature, not in the zoos. Uh, we, we pay attention in uh, putting in the test set, not the individuals that we used for the training, uh, but they're actually kind of similar. Uh, but I think what matters is that the lighting conditions are quite always the same. We are near the equator. And then the zebras, they must, when you see the zebra during the day, they must be standing, walking, eating. They just, they are like horses. They just uh, uh, lay down for sleeping. And that happens at night where you would need thermal cameras. So at the end, uh, a simple 3D post prior is sufficient to generate a synthetic data set that represents uh, the animals. Instead, if we look at the exam, for example, at the tigers, here is a lot different. So this is the Amur tiger, and is a, is a again is an endangered species, and um, it's very hard to to observe um, in nature. And uh, so there is this um, uh, data set. It's called the Amur tiger recognition workshop data set. Uh, and these tigers are filmed uh, and uh, in captivity. So this data set has this uh, uh, very different uh, um, backgrounds, uh, lighting conditions. And uh, given these are frames obtained by videos, most of the time you have motion blur and uh, strong shadows. And um, so it would be really co complicated to create a synthetic data that can actually be representative of this data set. So here uh, we, we, and also the tiger, they have uh, kind of complicated poses like cats. If you have cats, you know what I mean. So what we did uh, in this case, uh, we 
uh, we got this uh, uh, tiger uh, with all this animation data. And um, so we created a 3D pose prior that includes uh, also like uh, uh, laying down poses, more complicated poses than the one that we use for the zebra. And also instead of using small, what we did here was to create a synthetic um, shape space similar to the one that we have uh, considered for the lioness. And, um, and with this synthetic uh, shape space, uh, we created a sort of, sort of fake uh, um, generative uh, model for, for tigers to be used with this uh, uh, skeleton and with this uh, animation data. And then uh, we designed this uh, network, uh, which is trained only uh, with 2D information. Uh, and, uh, and this network, actually this uh, uh, shape predictor that uh, represents the synthetic uh, shape space and this uh, uh, pose uh, decoder, let's say autoencoder, uh, that is trained on the synthetic um, animation sequences. Um, so during training, we try to improve the shape and the pose by uh, fine tuning the network, the, the weights of this um, encoder. So here are some results. Um, on, the, on the left, uh, you see the, the output of the synthetic model and on the right, the output when uh, fine tuning also the shape uh, with the same trick, trick, the same uh, representation with the vertex displacement. And uh, you see that we can uh, we can uh, reconstruct these tigers also when they are lying down, and uh, also if they have like a, like a shape which is more like a chubby with respect to the original um, original template. And so, so why why do we do this? Uh, why do we use this uh, new tiger model? Given we have a tiger in small, uh, we could have used uh, uh, try to um, uh, to map the animation data to the small skeleton. And uh, so the 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 reason we did this is that uh, we wanted to explore if we could have a more or like a generic uh, tool for uh, doing. Uh, um, arbitrary animals, so we try also with the sardines. <laughs> Maybe are not very interesting, but uh, at that time uh, the first uh, the first title of for this paper was um, anyone can fit, uh, which was inspired by the Ratatouille movie. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, it was any anyone can cook? Um, but anyway, so. Um, to we'll go back to to the to the open problems uh, now you can think that if you can reconstruct this is 3d tigers and you can uh, get the texture map uh, instead of doing a, a comparison in 2d uh, for a fixed viewpoint uh, to match uh, the skin you can uh, match skins in the canonical space of the texture map um, it's actually there is a, an old paper where they do they were doing this, but uh, from the real tiger skins. So now you can kind of simulate of matching the skins without killing the tigers. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So, so far, uh, we have uh, seen the, the multi-animal model, small, applied to a single uh, species, the zebra, and this uh, single synthetic animal uh, model applied to the tiger. So how, how to, to move forward? I think there are uh, two, two directions, um, generalization and accuracy. So um, if you consider horses, uh, for uh, uh, lameness detection. Um, so you want to detect when the horse is in pain uh, because you want to act before it has a, as a irreversible uh, injury. And to do this, uh, you need to really understand 
understand when it's working in a in, in asymmetric way. And this is really it's hard to detect when unless the, the horse is really in pain, it's really hard to detect. And for doing this with automatic methods, you need a very high um, resolution and very high accuracy. And on the other side, if you think of, uh, I don't know, doing um, animal um, action recognition from camera traps, you might not need the same level of accuracy. But in this case, you might want to have a model that is flexible, that can represent different species altogether. So that in the in this uh, animal world, uh, there are um, every problem needs uh, a different uh, scale and uh, resolution. So we are working on horses at the moment. Um, so initially, what we did uh, was to try to create a small model for horses uh, using a lot of toys. And here you see what um, you already know what this is is the post normalized uh, training set. So we, we learned a small model for horses, uh, but uh, and this is the results of the shape space. And uh, you can immediately see that there is a lot of room for improvement on this model. And first of all, uh, so we 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 have the, the lioness uh, segmentation uh, with this long tail uh, with many parts, but we don't need all those parts in the horse. And maybe we would need more parts in the neck, which is longer, and in the legs. And also the rest goes for the, the lioness, is very for the of the horse. It's wrong because the horse stands on the on the um, nails. So my student C uh, actually she questioned why using the lioness to fit the horses. And uh, she decided to use a, a horse to feed the horse, <laughs> which makes sense. And uh, so she created this model um, that she called H small, uh, which is a, a small model only for horses, where the, nat the natural pose is a rest uh, um, pose for horses, and the segmentation is actually more uh, suitable uh, because it matches more the anatomical skeleton of a real horse. And uh, then she she started using this model for for a few applications, and this um, is some some preliminary work uh, on uh, lameness detection. Uh, this is a data set where um, lameness is induced. It's like uh, they put uh, um, something uh, on the hooves under the hooves of the horses, like if you had a, a stone in your uh, shoes. And um, and then the horses are captured on this trade mill with motion capture um, markers. So here we tested if using the model for lameness detection uh, is actually a good idea. And it turns out it is because we we have uh, better uh, lameness recognition using the model than without using using the model. Okay, so. Um, there are species which actually are also of um, wide interest, like very domestic animals, for example, dogs and, and cats, and they have a huge variability in shape and appearance, like the dogs. In small, we have only two dogs, <laughs> so the, the small model is not really appropriate as it is for, uh, for doing 3D reconstruction of dogs. But the question is, do we really need to scan all the existing breeds uh, to do a dog um, shape and pose estimation? So this, uh, this summer at CVPR, uh, we presented this work. Uh, it's actually work from Nadine uh, Rick, uh, um, with uh, also uh, Karen Schindler and Michael Black. And it's called Bark, uh, Learning to Regress 3D dog shape from images by exploiting breed information. And here our goal, as, it, as you can see, and this uh, feature is given an image, we want to reconstruct the 3D dog. And we do this by using uh, side information uh, in the form of breed labels. 
and we have been uh, inspired uh, in this work uh, by uh, this paper. And here uh, the author, they look at the genome, the dog genome, and they create this uh, uh, amazing um, uh, cladogram uh, where all these plates that are represented with different colors, uh, they correspond to clusters uh, where uh, the samples have um, similar genetic information. And here you cannot really read very well, but I did an alternative uh, visualization. And uh, so inside these clades, uh, there are um, breeds, uh, they, are, uh, they have some similarity for shape. So this was a kind of, uh, kind of inspiration, but we didn't use uh, this information actually in the method. Uh, we use um, uh, just the breed labels, but with the following observations that if we have two images of dogs of the same breed, they're likely to have a more similar shape than dogs of different breeds. Of course, there are uh, interspecies, uh, um, interbreed similarities, um, but it could be like that a husky is a puppy or a male husky is bigger than a female husky. Uh, but we kind of assume that uh, um, the, the, the shape differences that are uh, depends on the, the age, on the, on the sex, uh, they are uh, less uh, predominant that the differences across uh, different breeds. So for, for, uh, for doing this, we needed a data set uh, with the breed labels. And uh, fortunately, uh, Benjamin Bix and uh, colleagues um, they took an existing data set with breed labels called uh, Stanford data set and they added uh, segmentation masks and 2D landmarks. So uh, we could train this um, uh, regression network only on 2D data. And Nadine designed this uh, uh, network, uh, which is uh, uh, composed by two branches, a shape uh, branch and a pose branch. And it works uh, in this way. So you have an input image and then a stacked hourglass network that predicts a segmentation mask and 2D key points. And then the segmentation mask is concatenated with the image, is encoded uh, into a latent space Z. And from this latent space, we predict the breed label and the shape variables, betas, and we create the small model. Then uh, we take the bone lens and uh, we, uh, we compose, we concatenate the bone lens information with a 2D encoding of the segmentation mask and the 2D key points. And from this information, we estimate the 3D pose, translation and camera parameters. And with all this information, we recreate the 3D uh, doc. And uh, the training uh, has like a, a set of, um, of losses. So we have um, some losses that uh, um, encourage consistency uh, with the to the annotations from the Stanford extra data set. So segmentation loss and the key points loss. And then we have some uh, uh, weak uh, priors. Uh, to help uh, the network to cope with the missing or ambiguous evidence. And uh, we have consistency between the reprojection of our 3D prediction and the image evidence, meaning silhouette reprojection loss and key points reprojection loss. Uh, but um, the novelty of this work uh, comes from these uh, breed related um, losses. And we have three uh, breed related losses. Uh, one is a triplet loss, one is a breed classification loss, and we also have an extra uh, optional um, I don't remember. Um, prototype, actually, we call it prototype, uh, uh, 3D prototype loss, we'll explain later. Uh, 
no, actually, we'll explain now. So this breed, uh, breed uh, uh, prototype loss, uh, suppose you have for a few breeds, uh, you have some uh, uh, reference uh, uh, CG model. Uh, so you can uh, uh, take this uh, uh, reference animals and uh, encode them uh, into the small model and you use uh, this uh, uh, reference betas uh, to drive the uh, generation of um, of dogs with uh, um, accurate shape features corresponding to the breed uh, that you are uh, you are considering. And this we found out is important because uh, we supervise only with silhouette. And so from the silhouette, you get some information about the body, but you don't really get uh, information about uh, uh, fine grain uh, shape. And uh, um, the other losses, the triplet loss and the breed classification loss are actually the core of our method. And they work together uh, to kind of uh, shape uh, uh, the latent uh, shape space uh, such that uh, we have um, a breed aware structure. And I can explain this uh, with this, uh, um, this plot. So the first here on the left, this is the latent space of the test set uh, represent projected into a 2D um, visualization. Without the breed, sorry, the um, every dot is a sample, is a test set image. And uh, um, so uh, the colors correspond to the clade in the uh, cladograph. And the saturation correspond to different breeds in the same cladogram, in the same clade, sorry. And the bigger um, uh, shapes, they are they are the, the center of each uh, clade. So if we don't use breed similarity laws, all these centers are in the middle, uh, showing that there isn't structure in this latent space. Instead, if we use this, uh, the breed similarity loss, we see uh, actually these clusters that correspond to the clades. And this is confirmed by, so the improvement is confirmed by our result. So without the breed losses in the first row and with this uh, breed losses is uh, the second uh, row. And so in particular, you can notice for the, the Boston bull at the, right, the, the better uh, shape uh, prediction. And this is a comparison with the state of the art that was uh, Waldo, and we improved uh, uh, both quantitatively and also qualitatively over, over Waldo. And uh, these are uh, some more results uh, for uh, we have. So Stanford extra test set has several breeds, and we 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 can generate uh, um, realistic breeds for most of them. Um, and also we we downloaded uh, some pictures from the American Canon Club webpage webpage uh, for breeds that were not in the training. They are not actually in the in the Stanford extra data set, and we can uh, still predict. Uh, good 3D shapes for unseen breeds. OK, so I would like to conclude uh, with uh, um, a few few comments on related work and a short discussion. So what's stranded today, so that finally people are starting to look into animals. I think the first uh, uh, paper uh, that I presented at CVPR, I was in the human uh, section, uh, but now uh, there are more uh, people working on this topic. <laughs> okay. And um, this is one example of uh, what's trendy now. So creating avatars from images and video without using a 3D model, without using an existing template. So here, for example, on um, this method, Lassie, they take a set of images and a generic 3D skeleton, and then they can uh, reconstruct uh, this 3D animal. And uh, here they also do the elephant, but uh, actually for the elephant, they use the neck to represent the head 
and the and the the head part represents the trunk. Um, and this is the other from this group. Uh, uh, it's very active um, on um, on animals, on cats, uh, and uh, they can uh, create these avatars from video. And these are just creating. Uh, this not just uh, these are creating. Um, an avatar from the subject, so they're not creating a generative model. And to my um, to my knowledge, uh, the only group that is uh, is uh, working on uh, actually creating these uh, generative models is um, uh, the group from uh, Mark Badger at UPenn, and they do they do birds. So uh, to conclude, the, the, what are the current animals model limitations? Uh, they are not learned or tested on real 3D data. Um, they have a limited uh, 3D pose prior, uh, mostly um, coming from synthetic animations. They don't have dynamic deformations that you may see, for example, in a jumping tiger. And the texture, there is no texture, or the one the, the texture models that I've seen are very, very limited. And current, uh, what are actually the current real limitation in this field is data. There is no data set with 3D ground truth for learning 3D, for evaluating shape, or for 3D evaluating 3D pose reconstruction. And I think uh, uh, what we need. Uh, to stimulate our research in this field is uh, our uh, animals benchmarks, uh, which accurate uh, information uh, in order to understand if a task that we say we will do, like both and gender from shape or age from shape, are actually possible. And this is my conclusion, and thank you for your attention.